away and says, come back next week. So Billy comes back again the following week, and the sensei shows him the same one move and had Billy practice the move. And he sends Billy away, says, come back next week. So Billy comes back again the following week, and again the sensei shows him the same one move and has Billy practice the move. This goes on for a couple of months. After a couple of months, the sensei says to Billy, Billy, you're ready for your first karate tournament. Billy can't believe what he just heard. He says, the sensei, how could I be ready? I don't have a right arm and I only know one move. Sensei says confidently, you're ready. Billy's so nervous. He doesn't want to tell his friends at school. He doesn't even want to tell his mother. He goes along with the sensei to the karate tournament. It's time for his first match. He's standing on the mat facing his opponent. He's freaking out. He's so nervous. He's never been in this situation before. He doesn't know what to do. He looks over the sensei and says, what do I do? Sensei says, do the move. He does the move. He wins the first match. It's time for his second match. Again, he's on the mat facing his opponent. He's still really nervous. He doesn't know what to do. He looks over the sensei and says, what do I do? Sensei says, do the move. He does the move again. He wins the second match. This goes on round after round after round. He keeps winning match after match after match. He gets himself all the way to the finals of the karate tournament. For the final time of the day, he's standing on the mat facing the defending champion. He's still nervous, but now he's gained a lot of confidence because he's tried this move, the only move he knows, and it's worked for him every time. For the final time of the day, he looks over the sensei. No words need to be spoken. He nods his head at the sensei. The sensei nods his head back at him. He does the move. He wins the entire karate tournament. The crowd is going crazy. <laughs> Billy is ecstatic. He's never accomplished anything like this before in his life. He's driving home in the car with the sensei. He says to the sensei, Sensei, I don't understand. How could I possibly have won this tournament? I only know one move. In the middle of the sentence, the sensei stops him. He says, Billy, you have mastered the most difficult move in all of karate. There is only one defense for that move. For your opponent to defend that move, he would have to grab your right arm. <laughs> Throughout my entire life, my entire career, I have been trying to master the most difficult moves when it comes to distance running, so that then I can then share it with the athletes I coach or with other coaches. So we're gonna have a lot of fun over the next two days. So we're gonna start with discussing the details of interval training. And I don't know how clear that is all the way in the back, because it's kind of small up here, but if you guys wanna move up, then feel free to move up closer to the front. The jokes are also funnier the closer to the front that you get. So you just keep that in mind. I've been interested in this subject of interval training for a very long time. And even as a kid, I used to ask myself, how can I understand interval training to run faster? I don't know if you can see that shirt back there, but my parents must have known what field I was going to pursue because they bought me that shirt. It says, I love intervals. <laughs> so what is interval training? Well, everybody, every runner in the world does this, but how many people really know what they're doing when they go to the track and do an interval workout? So a method for improving fitness by breaking up a period of work into periods of work and rest. Now that may sound like a very obvious thing, but that is the premise of interval training. And when you understand what an interval workout tries to do, then you can more easily design workouts. Because a lot of people don't understand this simple premise, and they design workouts in such a way that, well, they could have run at that pace continuously. And the whole poor purpose of an interval workout is to take a set amount of work and break that set amount of work up into periods of work and rest and work and rest so that you can accomplish either more total work at a given intensity or even at a higher intensity than what you could have done if it were a continuous period of work. So we'll keep coming back to this because this is the premise for interval training. And we can manipulate four variables, of course. We can manipulate the time and the distance of each rep, the intensity or the pace, the speed of each rep, the time of each recovery interval and the number of reps. What do most athletes, every time they go to the track, what is it that they want to do? Which one of these four is the one that, that they usually want to focus on? The speed, right, the pace. We 
automatically compare ourselves to the workout we did the week before, and we want to see that we're running faster today than we did last Friday. But that is the last thing that should be touched. There are other ways to manipulate an interval workout. We can focus on the time, or if we're on the track, we can focus on the distance of each rep and make it longer or shorter, however we want to manipulate the workout, the time of each recovery interval, and then we can also manipulate the number of reps. How fast you run the workout should be the very last thing that is touched only when the athlete's fitness has reached a higher level, which you know from a race. So another premise here is that the races dictate the training speeds, not the other way around. Distance runners don't get faster by practicing running faster. That's for the sprint group over there. Distance runners get faster by increasing the volume of work at a given pace. Volume always predominates for distance runners until such time when you do the anaerobic speed work and then it's all about the speed. But until you get to that anaerobic speed work, it's all about doing more work at a given intensity. And it's always better to run more reps at the correct speed than fewer reps at faster than the correct speed. So we'll talk a little bit about the history of interval training. It's got an interesting history. Like a lot of things in life, it starts with runners. Run, distance runners are so special. A lot of things. We have another talk I'll be giving later is on periodization. Periodization also started with runners. And interval training started with runners. So originated in Europe in the 1930s as a way to develop fitness in competitive runners. First studied by a German coach, Waldemar Gerschler, and a physiologist, Hans Reindel, at University of Freiburg, which was back then East Germany. You know, the East Germans and the Soviet, the former Soviet Union, they were the two countries that were really at the forefront of sports science. And so the way they did this was, uh, was pretty ingenious. They looked at interval training from a cardiovascular standpoint and looked at well, what's happening in the recovery periods in between periods of work. And so I'm going to quiz you a little bit. I know it's first thing in the morning, you may not want to quiz, but we're going to, we're going to work on this together. If your athletes go and run hard for a period of time, and then they either stop or they slow down and they start jogging, what happens to heart rate when they're recovering in between reps? What's happening to heart rate? It's dropping, right? It's dropping pretty rapidly. The more fit you are, the faster it drops. And then what's happening? You have all this blood that's in the periphery, right? Going to the muscles, but that blood has to come back up to the right side of the heart in order for the left side of the heart to pump it back out through the arterial circulation. And so, you know, we have this blood that goes around in a circuit. First through, from the left ventricle, it goes through the large arteries and then the smaller arterioles and then the very tiny capillaries that perfuse the muscle fibers like an intricate spider web. The muscles will extract whatever oxygen it needs to do the job to hold the pace that you're asking your legs to hold. And then we come back up the other way through the veins. Again, through the small capillaries and the larger veins then the small veins, the venules, and then the largest vein, the vena cava. And from there, we go on the right side of the heart. So that return of blood through the veins, that's called the venous return. And the venous return comes back up to the right side of the heart. And so you have the slowing heart rate in an interval workout during the recovery period, you have a slowing heart rate, but what happens to the venous return? What's going on with the venous return? It's increasing, right? We have to get blood, in order to pump the blood out, we have to get the blood from the periphery, from the, the musculature, we have to get that blood back up to the right side of the heart as fast as possible because we can't pump what we don't have. We have to get the blood back up. So we have an increased venous return, but we have a slowing heart rate because we've slowed the intensity. We're either jogging or walking around now instead of running hard. So VO2, the oxygen consumption has decreased, the heart rate is decreasing, but we have an increased venous return. So with an increased venous return and a slowing heart rate, what does that allow more time to happen? What does that allow something to happen? The blood's going to the right side of the heart, then it goes to the lungs, then we come to the left side of the heart, right? So imagine if we have a slowing heart rate. When you have a fast heart rate, is there a lot of time for blood to dump into the left ventricle before it gets pumped out? No, because the heart's pumping really quick. But now we have a slowing heart rate, so we have more time now in between beats, right? That more time 
allows for a greater volume of blood from the venous return to pour into the left ventricle. And the more blood you have in the left ventricle at the end of the recovery period of the heart in between beats, that's called the end diastolic volume. You ever get your blood pressure checked? You have systole, the top number, and diastolic blood, volume, um, blood pressure, the bottom number. Systole, systolic blood pressure, <coughs> systole is the contraction phase of the heart. Diastole is the resting phase of the heart. So the amount of blood, I know I'm throwing a lot of words here, but I'm hoping it makes sense as we go through this. So the amount of blood being dumped into the left ventricle in between beats, that's called the end diastolic volume. The volume of blood that's in the left ventricle, the end of diastole. And so what does that allow? Then the heart contracts, and then what happens? Say it. Goes to the lungs. Well, now from the right side it goes to the lungs. The left side it goes to everywhere else in your body. But because we have a slowing heart rate, we can get a greater end diastolic volume because we have more time in between beats for that chamber to fill with blood. Imagine if you have a glass, but that glass is only under the pour for a fraction of a second. How much water can you get in the glass before it's pulled away? Not that much. But if that glass sits there for five seconds instead of one second, can't you pour more water into the glass? And so the exact same thing is happening here. And so when they studied interval training, they focused on what's happening in the interval of time between reps. Because if you have a greater end diastolic volume, then with every subsequent beat of the heart, you have more blood ejected out of the heart. And who knows what that's called? The volume of blood ejected at the left ventricle of the heart per beat. What's that called? That's the fraction, so if we express it as a fraction, very good. That's the fraction, what about if we express it as a volume? Stroke volume. Your stroke volume, the volume per stroke, the volume per beat, that's how much blood is pumped out. And that is a big, big, big difference between somebody who is cardiovascularly fit and a sedentary couch potato. The biggest cardiovascular difference between fit people and not fit people is their stroke volume. How much blood is leaving the left ventricle of the heart per beat? And why is that so important? What's carried in the blood that, we, that distance runners need? Say it. Oxygen. The more oxygen we can pump out of that heart per beat and per minute, guess what? The faster your runners are gonna run. Any race, from 800 meters up to the marathon, and even beyond the marathon. Distance runners, one of the hallmark characteristics of a good distance runner is a very large stroke volume. And then you take your stroke volume and you multiply that by the heart rate and you get cardiac output. The volume of blood being ejected at the left ventricle of the heart per minute. And that's huge. The best distance runners in the world have a very, 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 very high cardiac output. They pump an enormous amount of blood with each beat and with each minute. And that's one of the things that makes a distance runner so good. And so when they studied interval training, they knew this. They put together pieces of physiology and understanding what's happening to the heart and what's happening to the venous return and ultimately what happens to the stroke volume. And so in an interval workout, we get many peaks in the stroke volume because we have many recovery periods in between periods of work because that's when stroke volume peaks. It's not gonna peak during the run, it's gonna peak immediately after when you have reduced the intensity and you have this enormous stroke, uh, this enormous venous return coming back to the right side of the heart and ultimately then in the left side of the heart. And so the heart is pumping an enormous amount of blood with each beat during the recovery interval. And so they place the emphasis of the workout on the recovery interval. And that's why it's called an interval workout or interval training. It's not about what's happening during the work, it's about what's happening in the recovery interval between the periods of work. Does that make sense, yes or yes? Yeah. Yes, sir. So again, I don't know if you can read that back there. It just says primary stimulus for cardiovascular improvement occurs during recovery intervals between reps rather than during periods of activity as the heart rate decreases from an elevated value. So they place the emphasis of the workout on the recovery interval, and that's what prompted them to call it an interval workout or interval training. 
Whereas most runners, they talk about intervals, they're referring to the periods of running. But the term interval workout really refers to the interval of time in between the periods of running. And so this was what they originally did with the runners that they tried this on. They had them run for 30 to 70 seconds at an intensity that elevated the heart rate to 170 to 180 beats per minute. And then they would have sufficient recovery to allow the heart rate to decrease to 120. And so when the athlete's heart rates decreased to 120, then they would start the next rep of 30 to 70 seconds. So now, I mean, interval training will go through. It can be done many ways, because we can do sprint interval training. That's not about the cardiovascular system. But when interval training was first developed and designed, it was with the heart in mind and how to improve the, the performance of the cardiovascular system. Isn't that interesting? Yes, Dr. James, that's very interesting. Oh, I'm glad you think so. How clever is that? This is what happens when you understand physiology and then you learn how to apply it. You can start to think outside the box because you don't just see the box anymore. Most people just see the box. But when you have this theoretical framework, when they, they understood cardiovascular physiology, and that, was, that enabled them to then design interval workouts in such a way that you can improve the heart stroke volume and cardiac output. That's extremely clever. But that only happens when you have the theoretical framework behind you, when you understand what's going on cardiovascularly during an interval workout. That's brilliant. And then we come to the late 1940s, early 1950s, and this runner, Emil Zadopek, and that's why the subtitle of my talk is Chasing Zadopek, because Emil Zadopek, for those of you who follow distance running, he was from Czechoslovakia, which doesn't exist as a country anymore, but the old Czechoslovakia. In 1948, he was Olympic gold medalist, and, but it was what he did in 1952, four years later, that really put his name on the, the distance running history map. He won the 5,000 on the track, the 10,000 on the track, and then he also won the marathon. No athlete has ever won the 5K, the 10K, and the marathon at the same Olympic Games. No one even tries, no one tries to even do that because it's, it's extremely difficult to even try to do all three. But he did it in 1952. And so he was so successful that people started to wonder, what the heck is this guy doing in training? And he did a very high volume of interval workouts. You know, if you read some of the old-fashioned texts on running, you'll see you know, his workouts in there. He would do 40 times 400 meters, insane workouts with a very high volume of reps. Now, certainly, if you're doing 40 times 400, you know, how fast can you run the 400? You can't run that fast. But he believed that if you do a very high volume of interval training, then that also builds endurance that you don't just have to go out and run long and slow all the time. You can build endurance a different way through doing high volume of <coughs> intervals. And that's the way swimmers train. Anybody with a swimming background in here? Swimmer, you don't see swimmers unless they're like in a, a long distance ocean, you know, ocean swimmer or something. They don't just go out and swim for a couple hours like runners do. Most of a swimmer's training is interval training. Now runners have to limit how much interval training they do because it's weight bearing and that puts a lot of stress on the the skeleton. Swimmers, there's no stress on the skeleton, so they could do interval training every single day if they wanted to. But he was really the first one to, to really popularize this method of training because he was so successful. And then Hungarian coach Mahali Igoli developed the concepts of taking short distances and then breaking up into sets. So now we have reps and now we have sets, just like a strength training workout, right? And for the same reason, that he believed if you can collectively put all these reps and sets together, that that builds a lot of endurance. And then we come to the 1960s and the famous physiologist Per Olaf Astrand from Sweden. I got the chance to meet him a number of years ago, great guy. And he was the one in a, on a stationary bicycle in a laboratory in Sweden to figure out that the first statement that I had up there, that if you take a set amount of work and break that set amount of work up into periods of work and rest and work and rest, that you can achieve a total volume of work in a given workout at, a, at the same or even higher intensity. So 
So for example, you can run five times a thousand meters faster than you can run five thousand meters. Yes or yes? You can run 10 times 500 meters faster than you can run 5 times 1,000 meters. Right? Yes or yes? Yeah. And if you break it up even smaller, you can run 20 times 250 meters faster than you can run 10 times 500 meters. Right? So that's really the whole premise of interval training. That if you take this set amount of work, in this example, 5,000 meters, the smaller the segments that you break them up into, then the Either you can think of it two different ways. Either you can run more than 5,000 meters at 5,000 meter race pace, or you can run 5,000 meters at faster than what you could have done if you did it as a straight 5,000 meters continuously. And that's important because I see this all the time that when people design interval work, it's almost as if they forget this or they never learned it because I'll see workouts all the time like, uh, I'll give you an example, like 10 times 400 meters at 5K race pace. So what's wrong with that workout? 10 times 400 at 5K race pace. You tell me. Knowing that... Right. Because you could... Why 10, 10 times 400 is 4,000 meters. So why are you going to do 4,000 meters at 5,000 meter race pace when you could have done that continuously for 5,000 meters? So you either have to do, using that example, you either have to do 10 times 400 at much faster than 5K race pace if you're going to do 10 of them, or if you want to stick to 5K race pace, you've got to do a lot more than 5,000 meters worth of work because that's the whole point of doing it as an interval workout. Otherwise, you could have just gone and run a 5K at, that, at 5K race pace. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? yes? That's a really important point because I see that mistake made all the time. People forget what the whole reason to do it as an interval workout is. So always keep that in mind. What's the point of doing an interval workout? So that you can accomplish more total work at a given intensity or a higher intensity than what you could have done if you did it continuously. The performance benefits of interval training, there's a lot. This has been researched a heck of a lot. And improves fitness quickly, right? Every high school track coach in America knows that intervals are the fastest way to get fit fast because you can do a lot of intense work. Time-efficient strategy to induce skeletal muscle remodeling to a more oxidative phenotype. There's a lot of fancy words there. So your genotype you cannot be changed. Those are your genes. That's what you're born with. But the way genes are expressed, given the environment you put those genes in, that's your phenotype. And so if you do, in this case, a lot of aerobic kind of interval training, then you can, in a way, shift your muscle fibers to take on a more oxidative characteristic. You can make fast twitch fibers act more like a slow twitch fiber, even though they're still a fast twitch fiber, but you can make them act more like a fast twitch, more like a slow twitch fiber. You can give them better ability to develop their whatever small aerobic characteristics they have, you can make that better. And vice versa, right? If we did a lot of fast sprint training, we can make the slow twitch fibers act a little bit more like the fast twitch fibers. But they'll never become a fast twitch fiber because it's still a slow twitch fiber. But based on the training that we do, training is an environment. So based on the environment you put your genes in, they can be expressed in different ways. And that's our phenotype. Interval workout, so for example, in the research, the four minutes total work at 170% VO2 max induces comparable muscle fiber changes as continuous exercise. For example, 30 minutes at 65% VO2 max. For a long time, we thought that, that distance runners and other endurance athletes had to do a lot of long, slow, aerobic kind of training in order to induce certain changes, like increasing mitochondria and increasing aerobic enzymes. And, there's been a lot of research over the last 20 years to show that interval training can be just as effective to do those same things as well. And so this is promoted a lot in the general public who always complain that they don't have time to exercise, that you can get some of the benefits or a lot of the benefits that you can from just continuous exercise by doing an interval workout, even though it's a lot harder. So if people are willing to do harder, more intense work, they can save themselves a lot of time. Instead of going out and running for an hour, they could do a short interval workout. 
So from a fitness and general public perspective, this has been researched a lot as a way to show people that if you don't have an hour to exercise every day, that's okay. You do a short, fast interval workout, you can get a lot of the same changes. Turns on signaling the cascade that leads to the synthesis of mitochondria, and that's a big one. And a lot of that work comes out of Martin Gabala's lab at McMaster University in Canada. He's done a lot of work on, on interval training and looking at its effects on the mitochondria. So it happens through a different pathway, but you know how we adapt to a training stimulus is, you know, if you ever get a chance to read the, the molecular research, it's fascinating with how your body responds to a given stressor. And so it happens through turning on a signaling cascade from a different pathway than if you were to just go out and run easy for an hour or two hours. This morning, I got up really early and I ran for an hour and 15 minutes. I crossed over the bridge and I found the, uh, the river path and I just took the river path for a long while. I started in the dark, it was nice and quiet and peaceful. By the time I got done with my run, it was light. and It was beautiful. Who's, done, who's run that river path out here? It was beautiful, I went out this morning, it was beautiful. Such a great run. I was the only one out there. You got the, the ice covering the river, just like I assume it's not too deep. You probably can't go ice skating on there. Probably, it's probably not deep enough. But uh, it was pretty cool to go out by myself and I saw the ice cup. So there's, there's also psychological and emotional benefits just, just the long, easy stuff because you're outside in nature and it's quite beautiful. So while you're here, I recommend going in. It's right across the bridge. So cool. I, this is my, by the way, this is my first time in Minnesota. I've gone through the airport before, but this is my first time actually stepping foot inside Minnesota. Ooh, so excited. I don't have, maybe by the time I leave tomorrow, I'll have the accent down. <laughs> how, how do you say it? Is it Minnesota? Is that how, how you say it? Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> there you go. We got it back there. <laughs> and then also, as I mentioned, increases skeletal muscle enzyme activity. There's a lot of research looking at muscle enzyme activity with different kinds of interval workouts. And so with the increase in mitochondria, the enzymes come along with it because the enzymes are the little factory workers that catalyze all the chemical reactions of metabolism. So there's a lot of changes that happen with interval training. So it's a very effective way to make people fit. And so now with the rest of the, the talk, we're gonna go through all the different kinds of interval workouts and then we'll give examples. So we'll start with the slowest speed and then we'll work our way up the ladder and eventually get to the fastest speed. So after this, I have what's called lactate threshold. I always, if you have read any of my books, you'll uh, see I use the term acidosis threshold. Take the emphasis off of the innocuous lactate and put it on one of the things that causes fatigue, the acidosis. So I always call it the acidosis threshold. So we'll talk about that, then VO2 max intervals, the next fastest speed, then anaerobic capacity intervals, and then the very fast, the pure speed anaerobic power. Okay? So, we ready, Minnesota? I say it with a New York, New Jersey accent. You ready, Minnesota? <laughs> so, acidosis threshold, if you don't already know, it's the fastest sustainable aerobic speed. So, think of if you were to go outside along the river path and you start out slow, and then you, keep, you pick up the pace a little bit, you pick it up a little bit more, you pick it up a little bit more until you get to the pace that is the fastest that you can run that is still supported solely by aerobic metabolism. So I use the term a lot that it's comfortably hard. You're not pushing yourself because it's still aerobic, but it's the fastest speed that you can run that is still aerobic. That's the threshold. And so it's the fastest speed before anaerobic metabolism begins to play a significant role. Okay. Very good runners, trained runners, can hold their threshold for a, just about an hour. The general public, something less than an hour. But if you take someone who's a little talented, a little trained, then they can hold their threshold in a race type of a situation for about an hour. So at the elite level, the half marathon for men and even for women, they do it, and you know, now the world record for women is like 104. So at the very elite level, you know, they're holding their threshold for the entire half marathon until maybe the last mile or so where they're really pushing it and then they're probably going above their threshold as they're racing each other to the finish line. But in everybody else, it's gonna be something less than an hour that you can hold this pace for. 
So we train them with reps lasting five to 25 minutes, right? You can do very long reps. It's aerobic, so the reps can be very, very long. With short recovery, it was less than the time of the reps. Okay, and we'll have examples up here in a second. So adaptations to this kind of training. Increase the aerobic <laughs> system. So the aerobic system is made up of two parts. Any biology teachers in the room? Oh, we got one, we got a few. So the two parts of the aerobic system that you teach your students, Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. Okay? So we increase aerobic, we increase aerobic enzymes. Because the more enzymes, what do enzymes do? I just mentioned what do enzymes do? What's their function? I feel like I'm ignoring you guys over here. I promise I'm not. What do I'm gonna quiz them so you guys get a break. What do enzymes do? What's the enzymes nature role? Why are enzymes so important? And why is that one big adaptation to training that we make more enzymes? What do enzymes do? Catalyst for what? Chemical. Very good. That deserves a high five. <laughs> they catalyze chemical reactions. And ultimately, we're always trying to get ATP for muscle contraction, right? But to get that ATP, we can do it anaerobically, we can do it aerobically, but there's lots of chemical reactions to break down the things that we eat, the carbohydrate that we eat, the fat that we eat. We've got to break that down, go through many chemical reactions, whether it's anaerobic metabolism or aerobic metabolism. And ultimately, the end result is we make ATP. And the faster we make ATP per unit time, per second or per minute, then the more force we can produce against the ground and the faster we're gonna run. And so enzymes catalyze, they speed up those chemical reactions. So the faster we get ATP. And so that's why making more enzymes is a huge adaptation to training. Because the more enzyme activity we have, ultimately the faster we get ATP from muscle contraction. Does that make sense, yes or yes? Yeah. yeah. So that's a big adaptation, as we make more enzymes. We can also increase lactate clearance from the muscle. And where does that lactate go? You know, lactate gets a bad, I could speak for a whole hour on lactate and lactic acid, it gets a bad rap, but it's actually a very good thing. We need lactate to be produced. That lactate, once it's produced in the muscle, it goes places, a protein that physically transports that lactate out of the muscle and takes it places. It takes it to the heart, so the heart can use it as a fuel. It takes it to the liver, so the liver can turn that lactate into more glucose. That's been given a fancy term called gluconeogenesis. Gluco referring to glucose, neo referring to new, and genesis referring to the formation of. The formation of new glucose from something that was not glucose. And we can do that with amino acids, and we can do it with lactate. That's really clever. That's so clever, I'm just gonna open up a quick parenthesis. <laughs> Imagine if your car does this. Imagine you're driving down the highway, and your gas tank gets very, very low. There's very little gas left in the tank. And that's threatening to your car's survival, to run low on gas. And so a part of your car, the car's liver, let's just say the battery, senses that. And the battery will then take another part of the car, let's say the back seat, and it turns that back seat into more gasoline so that you can keep driving down the highway. That's what your liver does. Carbohydrate is so important to your muscle survival and your muscles prefer to use carbohydrate as fuel that when your muscles get low on carbohydrate and your blood sugar gets very low, the liver senses that and it will take amino acids from protein breakdown, and it'll take lactate, and it'll turn those amino acids and turn that lactate into glucose via gluconeogenesis, so that you can maintain high-intensity exercise. How cool is that? That's really cool, Dr. Jason. I'm so glad you think so. Your body is the most brilliant thing in the entire universe that we evolved a way to assuage that threat of running low on glucose. And we can make our own. Okay, close that parenthesis. We can increase the acidosis threshold to a faster pace, and this is the whole point of this kind of training. We increase the threshold to a faster pace, making what was once an anaerobic pace now high aerobic. And that's the whole reason to do this kind of training. 
to push that threshold to a faster speed, raise it to a faster speed, so that we can delay the onset of anaerobic metabolism or the inclusion of anaerobic metabolism. Because once we start to rely more on anaerobic metabolism, there's a lot of fatigue-inducing factors and the pace will slow down. So when you look at the best runners in the world, you know, the men's marathon world record was just broken a few months ago in Chicago. Do you guys follow the marathon? We've got the women's and men's Olympic trials coming up next, next weekend, next Saturday, a week from tomorrow. The men's marathon world record was just broken in Chicago in October. Just a shade over two hours, two hours and change he ran. It came out to, I have to do the math, I think it was 4.35 pace per mile, 4.35 per mile. That means that this guy, Kelvin Kiptum from Kenya, is running at 4.35 per mile, and for him, it is still aerobic. <laughs> because he has a very high threshold. His acidosis threshold is very high. Whereas for most people on the planet, 4.35 per mile would be highly anaerobic. And you'd be sucking wind. And you couldn't, most people couldn't even run one mile at 4.35. But he could run 26.2 of them, and it's still aerobic for him. He would have to run faster than 4.35 per mile in order for there to be a significant anaerobic component to that. And for women, it's just as impressive. A woman has run a 2.11 marathon now. I think that comes out to 5.08 pace or 5.07 pace. So for her, 5.07 pace is still aerobic. How many girls on your team can run one mile in 507? And so these athletes have a very high acidosis threshold. It's at a very fast pace. And so what is acidosis threshold pace? For a slower, more recreational runner, maybe you get a freshman or sophomore comes out for the team, they're not trained yet. It's about 20 to 30 seconds per mile slower than their two mile race pace. Or if they do it by heart rate, I mean, nowadays, you know, everyone's got their heart rate monitors, but uh, it's really only accurate if you wear the, the chest strap around your, your chest. It's not so accurate if it's just coming from the watch and reading the pulse and the wrist. But if they have the ability to, to measure heart rate during their workouts, it'll be about 75 to 80% max heart rate. For those more competitive, trained, it's about 30 to 45 sec 35 to 45 seconds per mile slower than their two mile race pace, and about 85 to 90% of the max heart rate. When people race, you can easily figure out at what pace their VO2 max occurs, at what pace their threshold occurs, because it's predictable. Because we run races at predictable paces based on these physiological factors. You can think of these physiological factors as acting as an anchor. You know, these elite runners can't do what they do unless they have a very fast pace at threshold, a very fast pace at VO2 max. They wouldn't be able to sustain the paces that they do for as long as they do. And like I said, the term I usually use with runners subjectively is that it feels comfortably hard. It's not an easy run, but it's also not you know, feeling like they're racing. It's not feeling like they're pushing. The other way I describe these workouts when I do have athletes do them is I always say with this kind of a workout, with threshold work, and whether you're doing it as a continuous tempo run or you're doing it as an interval workout, let the fatigue come from the duration at which you're holding the pace, not from the pace itself. If the fatigue is coming from the pace itself, what does that tell you? Then it's too fast. When you do the anaerobic speed work, then the fatigue comes from the speed itself, from the pace itself. But when you're training aerobically, even if it's high-end aerobic like it is with this, the fatigue should come from the duration of the workout. Okay? So let's look at the, what these workouts look like. So one example, I call it AT intervals, acidosis threshold intervals. Short runs at threshold pace with short rest intervals. So here's a couple of examples. Four times a mile at AT pace with one minute rest or eight times 1,000 meters at AT pace with one minute rest. There's a million ways you could do this. Those are just two of many, many examples. Okay, you just have a period of time. You can do it by time instead of by distance. And distance runners tend to think in terms of distance. You can do this on a track. But when you have a team, 
then oftentimes it's better to do it by time because then everyone can move through the workout at the same time because each rep will end at the exact same moment for everyone. Each recovery interval will start and end at the exact same moment for everyone. So when you're working in a team environment, a group, it's, even, it's better to do it by time so that everyone can do the workout together. And then what I call AT+. Plus. So this is just slightly, just slightly faster than threshold pace. Shorter runs and slightly faster than threshold pace with short rest intervals. So an example, two sets of four times 1,000 meters, so one kilometer, at five to 10 seconds per mile faster than AT pace, but you're only doing it for 1,000 meters. So you're not even doing it for a full mile. So it's just five to 10 seconds per mile faster, but just for 1,000 meters. So it's only gonna be maybe two, three, four seconds per 1,000 meters. So it's almost imperceptibly faster. You don't want it to be much faster because then it starts to become anaerobic. With 45 seconds rest and then a longer two minute rest in between the two sets. So with that workout, that's 8,000 meters. So that's five miles worth of work at just a hair above your threshold. To try to get that threshold to bump up to a, a slightly faster pace. So very high quality aerobic. And then, even though this is a talk on interval training, I like to be thorough, and you can train threshold with continuous. So below the line here, there's two ways you can do that, or more than two ways. An AT run, so that's what people refer to as the tempo run. Continuous run at threshold pace, so example, three to four miles, or 20 to 30 minutes at threshold pace. So that's the standard tempo run that a lot of runners do. You run right at threshold pace for the entire time, and that's it. Okay, so you raise blood lactate to its threshold value and you hold it there for the duration of the workout. Or a workout I like to use with uh, longer distance athletes who are training for half marathon and marathon instead of just going out and running a very long every Sunday to do some more medium long runs but make it of more quality. So here's an example, 12 to 16 miles of last two to four miles at threshold or three, two miles easy plus three miles at threshold plus another six miles easy plus another three miles at threshold. So those are really demanding long runs. But for someone who's really trying to improve their half marathon, their marathon performance, it's valuable to mix in some of the threshold running into some of the longer runs instead of just running long to slow and go 20 miles or 18 miles every Sunday. Okay, but I would, I would not do that for for your athletes, you know, they're only running 5K at the longest, they can just focus on these three, the tempo run and the two different kinds of threshold intervals. Okay, okay now we get to VO2 max intervals. The next fastest speed. So for those of you who don't know, or just by way of review, VO2 max literally stands for the maximum volume of oxygen that the muscles can consume per minute. And so you think that's important? It's very important. And as we were talking about before, the cardiovascular physiology, there's a few things that affect the VO2 max. You have the cardiovascular side, the amount of blood being injected out of the heart, then you have the blood flow, and then you have, are we done already? Well, we still have time. Oh, okay. They're early. They're already clapping. Throwers. What? Throwers. Oh, oh throwers, yeah. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. So we have the amount of blood leaving the heart, then we have the blood being, the traveling, the oxygen traveling through the bloodstream, and then we have the muscle's ability to use the available oxygen. So we have three different parts of this equation. And so cardiac output, stroke volume, the ability for the heart to push out a lot of blood with each beat, that's very important to improve the VO2 max. So we do this with reps lasting three to five minutes, with recovery intervals equal to or slightly less than the time of the reps. So we can target improvements in aerobic power by using the aerobic system at its fastest rate. So when you're running at VO2 max intensity, you're running at the fastest rate at which your body can consume oxygen. So you're revving the aerobic engine as fast as it can go. One of the best methods to improve cardiovascular condition, even if you're not a runner, just you want to improve your cardiovascular health, a VO2 max interval workout is the most potent workout a human being can do. If you're ever stranded on an island and you're only allowed to take one type of workout with you on that island, <laughs> this would be the kind of workout to take with you, a VO2 max interval workout. And so adaptations are many. 
We increase enzyme activity, again, because we are revving the aerobic engine. We're revving aerobic metabolism as fast as it can go. And we increase the VO2 max. That's the whole point of doing this. So we increase the VO2 max, and we increase the VO2 max by increasing the maximum stroke volume and the maximum cardiac output. We increase the max stroke volume a few different ways. One is left ventricular hypertrophy. That's a fancy way of saying we make the left ventricle of the heart bigger. Just like if you want to make uh, your biceps bigger, that's called hypertrophy. Bodybuilders live in the, the world of hypertrophy. They always want to make their, their muscles bigger. But the heart can also get bigger. It responds to training the same way your biceps responds to training. And if you can make that left ventricle larger, can't it hold more blood? The larger the left ventricle, the more blood it can hold. The more blood it can hold, the more blood it can subsequently pump with each beat. And the bigger the stroke volume. And so in my opinion, that's the most elegant adaptation to endurance training, is that we can actually increase the size of our heart and make it a better pump, to pump more blood and more oxygen with each beat. So as distance runners, we have a great capacity to love because we have a large heart. That line has never worked for me at the bar. <laughs> Don't women like a guy with a large heart? I thought they do. But that line has never worked for me. And then we also improve heart contractility, the ability for the heart to contract, just like you can train the ability for your biceps to contract. So through a better heart muscle, through a stronger contraction, the contractility, and the larger left ventricle, we get a larger stroke volume, we get a larger cardiac output. And so we put that all together. The VO2 equals the stroke volume times the heart rate times what's called the arterial venous oxygen content difference. The difference in oxygen content between arterial blood, blood going to the muscles, and the venous blood, the blood coming back up from the muscles to the right side of the heart, the venous return. The larger or wider that AVO2 difference, that means that the muscles have extracted, taken up more oxygen from the blood to use it. So that's a good thing. And then, as we mentioned, we multiply the stroke volume times the heart rate, we get cardiac output. So the VO2 equals the cardiac output times the arterial venous oxygen content difference. And the whole reason I put this equation there is because if you understand the components of what's improving the VO2 max, then you understand how to train it. So we can focus on either or both of the sides of the equation. We can focus on the AVO2 difference. That's really what's happening muscularly. That's the mitochondria, that's the capillaries, that's the enzymes. So we increase the volume of work that we do. We make more capillaries, we make more mitochondria, we make more enzymes. So we get a larger AVO2 difference. Or we can focus on the cardiovascular side through interval training and make the heart a better pump. So the VO2 max then, so the left side is the cardiac factors, the right side is the muscular factors. So the VO2 max then occurs when each of these three variables reach their maximum value. When we reach our maximum stroke volume, our maximum heart rate, and the maximum difference in oxygen content between arterial blood and venous blood. And that defines the VO2 max. So that also tells you something. If you were to do a VO2 max interval workout by using heart rate, at what percentage of max heart rate do you run at to do a VO2 max interval workout? When do we reach our VO2 max? Say it. When we're at, yeah, at that pace, and that pace corresponds to what heart rate? 100%, by definition. The VO2 max equals the stroke volume max times the heart rate max times the arterial venous oxygen content difference max. So when you do an interval work at, at VO2 max, you run at maximum heart rate. You're running at the cardiovascular system's maximum capability for it to do its job. So let's look at that. So VO2 max pace corresponds to the pace that elicits VO2 max. The fastest pace that can be maintained for about seven to 10 minutes. It turns out that that's the fastest pace that can be maintained for about seven to 10 minutes. So in a really good runner, if you have a, a good male two-miler, runs 10 minutes for two miles, it corresponds to approximately two-mile race pace. 
For everybody else, it might be a mile and a half or a mile and three quarter race pace. And 100% or very close to 100% max heart rate. For slower, more recreational runners, that mile to mile and a half race pace. Highly trained competitive runners, it'll be close to their two mile race pace. And it subjectively feels hard but manageable. A nine on a scale of one to 10, whereas a 10 is a race, it's the only time you run 100% all out for a given distance. So a VO2 max interval workout would be a nine on a scale of one to 10. So here's some examples. Four times a thousand meters at VO2 max pace with a one to one or less than one work stress ratio. Six times 800 with a one to one or less than one work stress ratio or 16 times 400 at VO2 max pace with a one to, in this case, less than one work to rest ratio. Which one of those workouts is the most difficult? Four times a thousand, six times eight, or 16 times four? Who thinks it's the first one, four times a thousand? Take a quick vote. Not a single person, oh, we've got one person in the back. Six times 800, who thinks that's the most difficult one? One person here. 16 times 400, who thinks that's the most difficult one? Okay, now let's start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Who's the guy in the back who said the first one was the hardest? You are correct. People see the 16 and they think, oh, that's really hard. And it is. But the first one, you're running for 1,000 meters at a time at your heart's maximum capability for it to do its job before you get a rest. So the cardiovascular load is much harder when it's continuous for a longer period of time. So four times 1,000 is harder than 16 times 400 at VO2 max pace. Because even though you're doing a lot more distance here, a lot more reps, you're getting a recovery after every lap. Does that make sense? But what does 16 times four enable you to do that you can't do with four times a thousand? Say it? More volume. More volume, right? Four times a thousand is 4,000 meters, six times eight is 4,800 meters, and 16 times four is 6,400 meters. So the advantage of doing 16 times four is that you can do a, more, a higher volume of work at VO2 max pace. But the trade-off is that the cardiovascular load, the cardiovascular stress, the metabolic stress isn't as high. Because when you're also running at VO2 max pace, what's going on anaerobically? Isn't VO2 max at a much higher intensity than your threshold? And so anytime you're running at a higher intensity than your threshold, what does that mean? that there's a significant anaerobic contribution and all the fatigue-inducing factors. The acidosis, the pH of the muscle starts to decrease. But if you're only running 400 at a time, it's not as much of a metabolic stress. So it's a less of a cardiovascular stress and it's less of a metabolic stress because you're getting recovery every lap instead of every, after every two and a half laps. Does that make sense? So this is what the workout would look like. If you can run one and a half miles in 10 minutes, that's 640 per mile. Four times 1,000 meters in 410 with a three minute jog recovery. Six times eight in 320 with a two and a half to three minute jog recovery. Or 16 times four in 140 with half the amount of time, 50 seconds jog recovery. What do you notice about the pace? As we go from 1,000 meters to 800 meters to 400 meters, what happens to the pace? This group's been pretty quiet. What happens to the pace? It's the same, very good. Why is it the same? What? Yeah, because you're training, the purpose of the workout doesn't change here. The purpose of the workout is to improve VO2 max. But what happens, especially with kids, when they see, oh, we're gonna do 400s today. They wanna fly, right? But you have to understand well, what's the purpose of the workout. It's to train VO2 max. You manipulate the other variables of the workout. You manipulate the time or the distance of the reps. You manipulate the time of the recovery interval. 
You manipulate the number of reps that you do. For a distance runner, it's better to do more volume at the correct pace than less volume at faster than the correct pace. Run only as fast as you need to meet the purpose of the workout. And so to train VO2 max, you run right up against that ceiling at 100% VO2 max. You don't need to run faster. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? Yes. I'm talking right after this anyway, so we can just, I can keep you here longer because we can just go right into the next one. Yeah, the next session's not until 10.30, so you're good, Dr. Yeah, Parker. we're just going to, what time is it? I don't know what time it is. It's 10 o'clock. Okay, we're just going to keep going. So although attempting to run faster when the reps are shorter, don't do that. Or tell your athlete, don't do that. Understand, teach them what's the purpose of the workout. If you're going to do it as 400, say, well, this is the pace I want you to run. And guess what? We're going to keep doing this until you are fatigued. In a few minutes, I'll tell you that these numbers of reps, that's arbitrary. The number of reps doesn't matter. That's predetermined before the workout even begins. So neglect, I just put it up there to make the point that you can do more volume, but the number of reps doesn't matter. You run at a given pace, and then you keep doing the reps until you are exhausted. Because that's what your body responds to, the fatigue. That's the stimulus for adaptation, the stress. It has to be stressful. If it's not stressful, there's nothing to adapt to. So if we were to plot a VO2 max interval workout, this is what it looks like. We have VO2 on the y-axis, the reps on the x-axis. The blue represents the reps, the red lines represent the recovery intervals. And so it's curvilinear, no, it's not a linear increase. You start running, right, your heart rate, your VO2, it increases very fast in the beginning, and then less so as you keep running. So it's a curvilinear increase. And then this dotted line represents your VO2 max, or your heart rate max. And so here's just three reps but you can see what's going on. We start the workout at some elevated VO2 or heart rate, depending on how intense the warm-up was. And then we may or may not reach that dotted line on the first rep, but then we recover and VO2 and heart rate again, curvilinearly drop. And then we start the second rep at a VO2 and heart rate elevated compared to what it was. That's why you don't want full recovery because you don't want this line to come all the way back down here and have to then work hard to get it back up. You want incomplete recovery. And then we start the second rep at something elevated compared to the first. Then we, hopefully, if we design the workout properly, we will reach that line at some point in that next rep. And then we'll recover. And then we'll start the third rep at something elevated compared to the second and compared to the first. And people see this all the time. You have your heart rate monitor. You can see how heart rate is climbing. You're starting the next rep at a higher heart rate than you started the previous rep. Now it's easy to see that kind of stuff with heart rate monitors because you don't want the heart rate to drop all the way back down to what it was at the beginning of the workout, because then it'll take longer time to get up there. And so the point is to spend as much time at that dotted line as possible. And then you would recover into a fourth rep, a fifth rep, but however many reps it takes to get exhausted. Because when you're up against this line, you're running at the heart's maximum capability for it to do its job. You know, when you all apply for the jobs at the schools that you te work at, teach at, you got a job description, right? You had to read a job description. When the heart applied for its job inside your body, the job description of the heart was just two words. What are the two word job description of the heart when it applied for its job inside your body? What is the only thing the heart ever has to do? Pump blood. Pump blood. That's the entire job description of the heart. Pump blood from before you were born until the moment you die. That's all it has to do. But that's a pretty big responsibility, is it not? So it's a good thing that the heart is not good at multitasking. You don't want a multitasking heart. If you want a heart that's good and expert at one thing and only one thing, pump blood. And so when you do this workout, that's exactly what you're doing. You're stressing the job description of the heart. You are making the heart do its job to its extreme amount. Pump as much blood as possible. And so if I go to the track and I bring my heart along with me, and my heart says, gee, Jason is taking me to the track once or twice a week, and he's making me work at my maximum capability for me to do my job. If I don't make some kind of adaptation, I'm not going to survive. I know what I'm going to do. This is my heart talking. I know what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to increase the size of my left ventricle so it can hold more blood and subsequently pump more blood with each beat. And I can increase my stroke volume. What a smart heart you have. And that's what happens. So that's why I said if you're stuck on an island somewhere and you can only bring one workout with you, this is the workout you bring with you. Because that's the workout that's going to make you and your athletes cardiovascularly fit. Your heart is going to grow larger, and that's called left ventricular hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, growth of the left ventricle of the heart. And if you've ever had an EKG, you can easily see this on EKG. Those squiggly little lines on EKG mean something. It's the electrical activity of the heart. You can diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy from an EKG. Now we get to the next fastest speed, anaerobic capacity. So this is speed endurance. A lot of coaches say speed endurance. Anaerobic capacity refers to the ability to regenerate ATP through anaerobic glycolysis, that energy system. So now we're moving away from the mitochondria, and now we're in the cytosol of the muscle, where anaerobic metabolism takes place, the fluid-filled portion of muscle, or anaerobic glycolysis, or the cutting or the breaking down of glucose to give us energy. So we do this with intense reps, lasting 30 seconds up to two minutes with recovery intervals two to four times as long as the reps. So much longer recovery now relative to the time of the work. We target improvements in anaerobic capacity by using anaerobic glycolysis as the predominant energy system. So that's why it has to be short and fast so that we rely on anaerobic glycolysis a lot during the workout. And so adaptations include increased muscle glycolytic enzyme activity. So now we're looking at a whole other set of enzymes. Instead of the mitochondrial enzymes, now we want to improve the enzymes involved in the chemical reactions of glycolysis. Improved buffering capacity of muscle acidosis. When the pH drops, the, what does the H and pH stand for? Hydrogen. Hydrogen ions. We increase hydrogen ions in the muscle, and that causes the pH to drop, and the muscle becomes slightly acidic. We have a way to buffer that. What did your grandmother put in the back of her refrigerator to absorb the smell of acidic food? Baking, baking soda. soda. <laughs> the active ingredient in baking soda, bicarbonate. We have a pool of bicarbonate ions inside of our muscles. And that buffers the hydrogen ions that we get from metabolism when we run fast. We take that bicarbonate, HCO3, and we add H to it, hydrogen. We make H2CO3, carbonic acid. And as soon as we make H2CO3, it breaks apart. What do you think H2CO3 breaks apart into? CO2 and water, H2O. You make your own water, and you make CO2. And what happens to that CO2? <sighs> That's why during an interval workout, your athletes breathe heavy, not to get in more oxygen. Oxygen has no problem at sea level diffusing from the air in our very tiny nostrils and into our lungs. If we want to get more oxygen to our muscles, what do we do? We don't breathe more. We increase our heart rate. We increase our stroke volume. And by by definition, then we increase our cardiac output. It's a cardiovascular responsibility to get more oxygen to the muscles. But the main stimulus to breathe, at sea level at least, is the CO2. And that's why during a fast interval workout, your athletes are huffing and puffing like they're going to blow grandma's house down. It's because of the CO2. So anaerobic capacity intervals, again, I just put examples. You could do a million different ways. Six to eight times 400 meters at mile race pace with a one to two work to rest ratio. Two sets of three to four times 300 meters at 800 meter race pace with a one to three work to rest ratio and then a longer rest, five minutes rest between sets. Four times 600 meters at 85% to 400 meter pace. That's hard. With a one to two work to rest ratio. So it's gotta be fast, not all out but fast, fast enough that you're relying almost solely on anaerobic glycolysis as your energy system. But then there's some aerobic metabolism because you're repeating the anaerobic efforts, right? When you repeat anaerobic efforts over and over again, then you're also calling upon the aerobic system. There's an endurance component to that. So it's not purely anaerobic. 
purely anaerobic would be, you know, you sprint 100 meters or 200 meters just once as fast as you can. But when you repeat that, then you're also calling upon aerobic metabolism. So again, there's many ways that you can do this. As long as the reps are at the short end, about 30 seconds, at the high end, no longer than the two minutes. And that would even go even shorter than maybe a minute 30, a minute 45. Because once you start to get two minutes, and certainly longer, then it also becomes highly aerobic as well. Okay? So the distance, you can, if you do it on the track, which most runners do, you can match the distance. So think in terms of the time, and then you can match the distance on the track to that time. If I want to go 30 seconds, maybe I do 200s. Right? Or maybe even 150s for the, the fresher, the slower runner. Maybe they go 150s. Exact reps don't matter. What matters is causing fatigue. So the number of reps is arbitrary. That's decided prior to the workout. But especially when you're in a group, what are the chances that everyone is going to fatigue at the exact same number of reps? That's not going to happen, right? They're not, they're not all twins, right? They're not all genetically the same. So the chances that on any given day, they're all going to experience the same amount of stress, the same degree of fatigue at the same number of reps, that's unlikely. And so it's better to just focus on one rep at a time. And so who cares if the seniors do 10 reps and the freshmen do five reps? They're still all getting the optimal training stimulus for them. So there are ways to individualize workouts in the context of a group, in the context of a team. And then we get to the fastest speed, the anaerobic power. So this is the real fun stuff. This is all out, pure speed. Anaerobic power refers to the ability to regenerate ATP through the phosphagen system, the creatine phosphate system. Very intense reps lasting 5 to 15 seconds with a pretty long recovery relative to the time of the reps, 3 to 5 minute recovery to allow creatine phosphate to be replenished back inside the muscle. Unlike something like glycogen, the stored form of glucose, that takes many hours to resynthesize that to store it back in the muscle. But creatine phosphate, or immediate store of energy, that takes a matter of a few minutes. That's quick. But if we want to isolate the phosphagen system and use that as a fuel source, then we have to take three to five minutes recovery so that we can then use that creatine phosphate again for the next rep, and again for the next rep, and again for the next rep. So we target improvements in anaerobic power by using phosphagen system as the predominant energy system. <coughs> Long recovery, I just said that. There's little gremlins behind the screen, and as I say something, then they're busy writing. That's why oftentimes I'll say something, and, and then there it is. But it's hard for the gremlins, because they're behind the screen. They have to write backwards. <laughs> Adaptations include increased fast twitch, motor unit activation, so now we are purely focused on those fast twitch muscle fibers and recruiting a lot of them. And then <coughs> increase another enzyme. So this energy system, phosphagen system, is only one chemical reaction. Glycolysis is nine, aerobic system is many more than nine. But the phosphagen system is only one chemical reaction, so it only has one enzyme associated with it, creatine kinase. And through this kind of training, the sprint training, we make more of that creatine kinase. So we can get from breaking down creatine phosphate and donating that phosphate to ADP to give us ATP, we can do that faster. The more enzyme we have, the faster we can do that, the faster we can get ATP. That's why a lot of bodybuilders will supplement with creatine. The supplementation doesn't do anything. You have to also train. But the more creatine phosphate you have, then the more fuel you have to then make more ATP. If you have more ATP, then you can sprint faster, you can lift heavier weight. That's why it's very popular among bodybuilders to, to supplement with creatine. So, do you want to give a break and just finish this up in your next session? Oh, yeah, you're you almost. That. Yeah, do you need a pee break? All right, let's It's up to you unless you think you're almost done. But. Oh, yeah, we're almost done. All right, let's just finish. Yeah, then. okay. So, quickly. ATP plus creatine phosphate under the action of creatine kinase gives us ATP plus C. But we can also take a 2 plus a 1, and under the action of a different enzyme, we can make ATP. We don't have to go through the details of this. But the point is that 
we have to add water to then break apart that ATP, and that's where the hydrogen ions come from that ultimately cause acidosis. The chemistry teachers love this stuff. So, again, a few examples. 10 times 20 meters at max speed with three to five minutes rest. 10 times 50 meters at max speed with three to five minutes rest. Four times 150 at near max speed with three to five minutes rest. So again, you can do this any way you want as long as they're within from a few seconds and no longer than about 15 seconds. And so final thoughts. Intervals are a great way to get fit fast. You can improve aerobic fitness more so than anaerobic fitness. It takes longer to improve endurance than to improve speed and power. And then fatigue matters more than the number of reps. And then, as I said, always run at the slowest speed to cause the desired adaptation. And so with that, I want to refer back again to Emil Zadepak. Because of all these short intervals that he used to do, people used to ask him, Emil, why are you running 100 meters? You're a distance runner. And Emil answered that question by saying, if I run 100 meters 20 times, that is two kilometers, and that is no longer a sprint. I'll finish off the line from Emil Zadepec. And so with that, I want to make a shameless plug for all my books. I have one of them with me, running periodization. One of my talks will be on periodization, so I don't want to get back on the plane with the book, so <laughs> they're here for you if you want. And then with that, finish off, make sure you stay connected if you're not already connected to me. And before we go, I do want to make one more important point. So now we know so much about interval training. Why do we do it? Why do you have your athletes do interval training? What's the main reason why you have them? Just call it out. You don't need to raise your hand. I know you're used to that because you're teachers, but just call it out. Why do you have your athletes do interval training? What? To improve fitness, all right, that's good, but that's not quite the right answer. What else? To make ATP. To make ATP, it's really good, but not quite the right answer. Why else? To run faster, yes, of course, but that's a good answer, but not quite the right one. Stroke volume, again, good answer, but not quite the right one. To rest, very good answer, but not quite the right one. The main reason we do interval workouts is because of something that we can do that no other animal on the planet can do. We can imagine. We can imagine ourselves faster than we are, fitter than we are. A freshman who wants to run a sub five minute mile can imagine a four on the clock. No other animal on the planet can do that. A lion in the wild that chases after an antelope to get lunch and if it fails to chase that antelope down, it doesn't eat that day. The lion cannot say to himself, gee, I wish I were faster. I wish I could improve my stroke volume. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the track and do an interval workout. Who's coming with me? A lion cannot think like that. No other animal can think like that. Go home and try to teach your dog or cat the concept of tomorrow. Tomorrow doesn't exist for any other animal. And so the main reason why we design these workouts in such a way so that we can get faster is because your athletes can imagine themselves faster. And that's what it means to be human. And that's why the job that we all have in here as coaches is the best job in the world. Because we can help our athletes imagine a future for themselves that does not yet exist. We can help them realize what it means to be human. And that is very, very powerful. So I wanted to finish with that. <laughs> okay, we're gonna thank you. We're gonna go. <laughs> so go to the bathroom, come back uh, because we got more. Okay. Uh, I was getting a text from Johnny. He forgot to put the box up. You can go put the uh, your name in a, in a box for, for drawings. They will draw between third and fourth session, not after this session. We'll start again at what, 10.35 instead of 10.30? 15-minute break? All right, let's rock and roll.
I'm leaving now. said to remind me to turn it off after the session. Did not do it, so it's still running. Still my fault. Uh, one couple notes here. Uh, it's been brought to my attention. There's this uh, little design on the back of the program. It's something called the QR code. I mean, you kids know what that is. If you want to access the videos uh, for later, you can be able to do that. I, I don't know how long they'll keep the videos up after the clinic. Uh, Iowa State did it. I was there. They did it for a couple months, and then they take them down. Um, the order has changed a little bit in Dr. Karp's presentation. He did interval training last session, and he is doing periodization this session. So if you're interested in the Kenyan running uh, lesson, uh, that will be tomorrow. So basically, it's a switch at this point. Tomorrow's first session will at 9 o'clock will be the Kenyan runners. All right? And then that will take care of that. And one more reminder then, if you didn't, uh, put your name in the in the box for the drawing. It's not too late. You can do it after this session. The drawing will be, I think, Johnny said between the third and fourth sessions. So you still have time to get your name in there, and then somewhere out there you'll find it. All right. So it looks like we have a few more, few more people uh, this session than last session. So today I'm going to let do again Dr. Carp finish this up and go with periodization. And uh, he said it's just a progression the way he did it, and it makes sense to us now to do the interval and the periodization. So uh, uh, anyway, let's welcome Dr. Carp again. for his first match. He's standing on the mat facing his opponent. He's freaking out. He doesn't know what to do. He's never been in this situation before. He looks over to the sensei. He says, what do I do? The sensei says, do the move. 
He does the move. He wins the first match. It's time for his second match. Again, he's on the mat facing his opponent. He's still really nervous. He doesn't know what to do. He looks over to Sensei. So what do I do? Sensei says, do the move. He does the move again. He wins the second match. This goes on round after round after round. He keeps winning match after match after match. He gets all the way to the finals of the karate tournament. For the final time of the day, he's standing on the mat facing the defending champion. He's still nervous, but now he's gained a lot of confidence because he's tried this move, the only move he knows, and it's worked for him every time. He looks over to the sensei. No words need to be spoken. He nods his head to sensei. The sensei nods his head back at him. He does the move. He wins the entire karate tournament. The crowd is going crazy. Yeah. Billy is ecstatic. He's never accomplished anything like this before in his life. He's driving home in the car with the sensei. He says to the sensei, Sensei, I don't understand. How could I possibly have won this tournament? I only know one move. And then know the sensei. The sensei stops him. He says, Billy, you have mastered the most difficult move in all of karate. There is only one defense for that move. For your opponent to defend that move, he would have to grab your right arm. Bigger laugh in the last session. <laughs> I have spent my entire life since I was a kid, I became so enamored with running and athletic performance. I have spent my entire life trying to master the most difficult moves so that I could share them with the athletes I coach and with coaches in a room in Minnesota. That's what I was thinking of as a kid. I cannot wait until I can come to the Minnesota Track Coaches Association Clinic to a place I've never been before, this is my first time in Minnesota, a place I've never been before so I could share the most difficult move. So you could be, and your athletes can be, just as successful as Bill. So are we ready, Minnesota? Yes. 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 Who went for a run this morning? I told you I was going to do this. I went for a run down the, the, I went over the bridge, I made a right, they told me you got to only make a right. I made a right, and I took that path way out there. It was dark when I left, it was so beautiful. Ice covering the river. So many, who went for a run along the river path this morning? Yeah. It was so beautiful out there. My first time in Minnesota, and look where I get to run, right along the river. I've been interested in periodization for a very long time. And even as a kid, I used to ask myself, how should I train runners to crush their races? My parents must have known what field I was going to pursue because they bought me that shirt. I don't know if you can see that all the way in the back. It says, I love runners. So before we get into the different models of periodization, we first have to talk about well, what the whole, what's the whole point of this? Why do we design a training program a specific way in the first place? And so we have to talk about well, what happens to adapt to workouts and a series of workouts and the whole process of adaptation. So if you go back to 1950 and Hans Selye, a famous endocrinologist from Hungary, and we have his general adaptation syndrome. Who's heard of the general adaptation syndrome from Hans Selye? One person in the back. All right, you get an A. Regardless of what, the, what Hans Selye discovered is that regardless, he did this experimentation on rodents, on rats and other small rodents. No matter what the stressor is, a uh, heat stress, in the case that he was studying cancer stress, uh, altitude stress, he would give the rodents drugs, so the stress from drug toxicity. No matter what the stress is, our body goes through a very specific sequence of stages. And so we have the initial stressor, and then what he called the alarm stage, where we really knock ourselves out of physiological disruption. We have an alarm to the body. And then after our body recognizes that alarm, then we work to recover from that alarm, recover from that stress. And so we're back up now on this side of the curve. So we develop a resistance to the stress. That's why and we heard a lot of this stuff during the pandemic and during COVID and, and drugs in general. That's why it's not so good to always keep taking the same drug because eventually you develop a resistance 
to that drug, and then the drug is no longer effective. Then you need a different drug. This happens with cancer patients all the time. Then you either need a different drug or you need a higher dosage of the same drug. Something has to change, the stressor has to change. And so we see this not just in running, but in many different stressors in life that we, that we have. So we develop a resistance, and we develop so much resistance during recovery that we over or super compensate to that stress. So that if that same stress were reintroduced, it doesn't cause the same degree of physiological disruption. But if we have too much of a stressor and we don't have enough time to recover, we can eventually hit this, what he called the exhaustion phase. And this will ultimately lead, if you're on this part of the curve, this will ultimately lead to death. And we see that with many diseases, with cancer in particular, that the stress is too severe that we cannot develop the resistance to. We cannot supercompensate or overcompensate to that stress. And it eventually takes our lives. And that's how we die. But not to put a negative on it. The rest of this will all be positive. That's the only negative thing. And so understanding this shows us, well, it tells us a lot of different things. One is the spacing of workouts. And when we do workouts at the right time versus the wrong time. Because you want to do a workout when we're in this part of the curve, specifically over here, right? That's when you want to initiate another stress. You want to introduce another stress. When we have recovered from the initial stressor and we are overcompensating to that stressor. And so this distance from here to there, well, that's not going to be the same for every single act. Right? We're not all going to have the exact same curve. And so this next slide shows where we can place the different workouts, that we can either place it too early or too late, but ideally, we want to place the next stressor while we're over or super compensating to the initial stressor. Now, we certainly wouldn't want to place a workout down here, right, because if we keep placing workouts down here when we're fatiguing, I and mean, this part is the fatigue curve, if we place the workouts down here, then, and we keep placing more and more workouts on the fatigue curve, our, we're eventually going to spiral downward. We're going to just put fatigue on top of fatigue on top of fatigue, and we're not going to ever get to see this. So where you place subsequent workouts matters. How often you provide the stress matters. But in different athletes, this is going to take a different shape. It's not always going to be the same. And that's one of the flaws of team training or group training because everyone does the workouts on the same days because you can't just have everyone do workouts on different days. You don't have a team anymore. So there is some compromise that needs to be made when you're working in the context of a group or a team. <coughs> so what is periodization? Method for structuring training into concentrated periods, well that's why it's called periodization, concentrated periods of specialized training using program variation of training loads. And the key words here are systematic, or systematic sequencing of multiple training variables to elicit improvements in fitness and performance. It's got <coughs> to be a system. Nothing is just done for the sheer sake of variety or nothing is done arbitrarily. You don't just do this kind of training now because you want to do it now. It's got to conform to a system. One of the questions I hate from people, they ask me all the time is, well, what should my training next week look like? What should I do? i got a race coming up in two months. What should I do next week? I have no idea. It all depends on what you did the last few months. It depends on what's going to come after next week. It all has to conform to a system. That makes sense. So we have many principles of program design of periodization. That the increases in training must be gradual, systematic, and progressive. So systematic means that the training isn't arbitrary with a smattering of workouts all around. It doesn't include abrupt changes in volume or intensity or volume of intensity. And each cycle of training builds on what came before so that the entire training program is seamless. So what you do today makes sense because of what you did last week and the week before that and what you're going to do the week after that and the week after that. 
and then progressive, that the training stress has to increase over time, whether it's the volume, whether it's the intensity, or the volume of intensity, that has to increase over time. Because eventually, if you have the same stress repeated over and over and over again, you habituate to that stress, and then there'll be no further adaptation. Now, habituation is important, it's an important concept in training. You want to repeat workouts and a series of workouts for a specific volume of training over and over and over again until you habituate to that. And then you need to change the stimulus somehow, whether it's more volume or more intensity or more volume of intensity. Periodization is more than a simple variation of training stimuli. It's about how and when training stimuli are varied and how and when the volume and intensity of training are manipulated throughout the year. And that's important. We make a bunch of assumptions at periodization. It's not a perfect system. There's a lot of assumptions we make. One assumption is that there are established time frames for the development and retention of specific fitness adaptations, and that biological adaptation to a given training plan follows a predictable course. We don't know that for sure, that if we do this today, this is what's going to happen three months from now. It's hard to predict that. Training plans, training phase duration, and rates of progression among talented runners can be generalized to less talented runners. And we make this mistake all the time. Just because three brothers in a small town in Norway do double threshold workouts means that everybody in the world should be doing twice a day threshold workouts. And you laugh because that's becoming popular. But those three brothers in Norway are extremely, extremely talented. And it is their talent that is the reason for their success, not the training that they're doing. If you buy the book Running Periodization that this presentation is based on, you will see that in the preface of the book I say how ironic it is that I have devoted my entire life to the study of training and wrote books about it when if you know anything at all about this sport, talent trumps everything else. The training only brings that talent to the forefront. And so just because three brothers, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the Ingebrigtsen brothers, if you don't know that those three brothers, well, they are the best three brothers, they're the best family of distance runners in the world. Jakob, the youngest one, happens to be the best. Oftentimes that happens, right? It's the youngest one that's the best. Maybe because they make the mistakes, the, the parents, the parent, the father coached the three of them. That also shows you it's all about talent. Well, what does the father know about? It's all trial and error. What, I mean, is he a physiologist? Is he a train, world training expert? No. It's just their father. But it's the talent that is the reason for their success. No amount of training turns a basset hound into a greyhound. You've got to be born a greyhound. But then when you have that greyhound, how you train that greyhound from the time that they're children to adulthood, that part matters. Because we ruin a lot of greyhounds in this country. How many of you have this prodigy that never becomes anything when they're adults? You look at the history of distance running in this country, boy, we have a lot of prodigies who in middle school, high school, who ended up never becoming anything as adults. And so the training does matter, and how the training has progressed especially through the developmental years, the preteen years, the teen years, that does matter because you can completely ruin their adult running lives. I know so many runners who they were so fast in middle school and then what happened to them? You would have thought, well, they're going to make an Olympic team and then they don't even get close to making an Olympic team. And as we'll talk about in the session this afternoon, this happens a lot with females, even more so than males. Females are a special case because once a, a girl becomes a woman, there's a lot of changes that happen. And so how those changes are handled by the coach is very, very important. And so there's a lot of really good female distance runners in middle school before they hit puberty. And then a, a lot of changes happen. They grow wider hips and a lot of other things happen. And, and then they don't run as fast. And then that affects them psychologically as well as physically. Why can't I run as fast as when I was in middle school, they say. And I've dealt with that as a coach. It's a hard thing to deal with as a coach because you've got to educate them on, on physical maturation and what it means to be a woman versus a girl, and the hormones, estrogen, progesterone, the whole menstrual cycle. Well, I foreshadow. We'll talk about that later.
But anyway, that's the point here, that just because it works for the best runners in the world doesn't mean, and with social media, it's 10 times worse. The situation is worse than it ever was. Because now we know what everybody's doing. We have Strava, we have Instagram. It's ridiculous. So don't get your training information off of Instagram, please. <laughs> because your athletes are probably following these elite runners, and they're like, whoa, they did this. Can we do that? What if we're following you? Well, then that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many, I'll tell you a funny story. You know how many people have blocked me on Instagram? Because it's so hard for me to hold back. I see people say things that are wrong all the time. And it's so hard for me to hold, I have to like bite my tongue. I, it's so hard for me to hold back, so I'll type a little thing and I'll put a comment. Because people don't like to be challenged. And then they just, they block me. So my goal for you is that you know so much that you too get blocked on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> what another assumption, various fitness attributes are best developed in a sequential way. Like who says that we have to always improve endurance before we improve speed? There are other ways to do it. And there are under, under certain circumstances in which we should do it a different way. And so we'll go through and talk about the different models of periodization. We also assume that training can be adequately forecast. And I already mentioned that at the first assumption. That we can predict what's going to happen tomorrow based on what we do today. So when periodization first started, I got to preface this by saying, when periodiz do you know when periodization first started? What really made periodization popular? Do you know which country was at the forefront of this? Norway. Norway? Oh, yeah. Okay, who said that? Who said that? Raise your hand. Okay, for future reference, I'll handle the jokes here. <laughs> it was not Norway. <laughs> it was the former Soviet Union. And even preceding that, periodization happened a long time. It was the Soviet Union. Who remembers the Soviet? The younger people in the room probably don't remember the Soviet Union. Who remembers the Soviet Union? They, were the, they won more medals at the Olympics than anybody else. They were at the forefront of sports science. Coaches over there had to be very highly educated. They were training experts. So a lot of what we know about training and periodization comes from the former Soviet Union. So when they first designed the structure of what training plans look like, this is how they broke it down. That a macro cycle, macro meaning large, macro cycle was a season of training. So about three to four months long. And then within that macro cycle, we have a general preparation period of four to five weeks, then a specific preparation period of three to four weeks, then the competition period of three to four weeks, and then there's recovery and transition period of two to four weeks until we get back into another macro, we start a new macro cycle with a new general preparation. And so this is what they would go through throughout the year. They would repeat this macro cycle three to four times a year based on that competitive season. So it breaks down nicely. You have a cross country season. Do you have indoor track in Minnesota? No, as cold as it gets here. You guys don't race indoor track, really? Okay. So, at, at, at what? At like a Pueblo. Oh, at the Pueblo. Okay. Uh, I grew up, uh, if you can't already tell from my accent, you can tell from my attitude. I'm from the Northeast. And I grew up in New York and New Jersey. I became a runner in New Jersey. And, and even in New Jersey, we had indoor track. So when I was in high school, we were racing cross country. Then we raced indoor track. And then we had raced outdoor. So we had three distinct seasons that we were racing in. And so this fits nicely into that. But if you don't have an indoor, a, a formal indoor track season, then it gets you know, enveloped into the outdoor. Then you have just a larger outdoor track season. You can start the training during the winter time. And then maybe you'd have a longer general preparation period. So that's the traditional way of doing it. And so here's periodization phase for one target race. So for like the general public that is training for one big race, like a marathon, you know, it's very popular these days. People train for that one big race that they go travel to. You know, the, mar the destination marathons are very popular these days. So it could look like this. So same five to this is a five to six month macro cycle, ten to twelve weeks for general preparation, eight to twelve for specific, and then one week for the competition because they're training for just for one peak race. But you could do it this way too. Like if you have 
a superstar athlete whose goal is, I want to win the state championships, or I want to place at the state championships, then you can design it this way. That you train through all the other races with the goal in mind to compete well at the, the state championships. So even at the high school level, you can gear the training toward one very important race if you know that athlete's got a chance to really do something special. And then the recovery transition will always be about the same amount of time. So then you can break it down into, so here's two macro cycles for one target race in each of two subsequent macro cycles. So general preparation, eight to 10 weeks, specific six to eight weeks, and the competition for one week. And then you move right into another specific preparation, and then another competition for one week, and then the recovery transition. So based on when the races are and what you're trying to target, you can design this several different ways. And so let's talk about the training period. So we have the macro cycle, the big cycle, and then within each macro cycle, you have the meso, the medium, the meso, the me medium length cycles, the meso cycle. So that's about three to six weeks long, typically. And they have a theme. They have one or possibly two training objectives, no more than two, usually one training objective. What is the theme of that cycle? Am I trying to train threshold? If you came earlier, then you remember the different kinds of workout. Am I trying to train acidosis threshold? Am I trying to train VO2 max? Am I trying to train anaerobic capacity? What's the theme of that cycle? Am I trying to build aerobic capacity with greater volume? It has to have a theme. So we use more workouts, if we have two, then we use more workouts to address the primary purpose, and then we can use fewer workouts or the less, the less volume of intensity to address if there's a secondary purpose. So we highlight, if there are two purposes, we highlight the primary purpose with the most number of workouts to address that, and if there's a secondary purpose, as there oftentimes is, as we move from one phase of training to another, we can use a maintenance training load so that we don't just forget what we trained previously. We bring that physiological factor along with us and we use a maintenance load and we do fewer workouts just to maintain that aspect of fitness as we're trying to target something else. And then we have the smallest period, the micro cycles. And again, these terms come from the former Soviet Union. So typically one week, but they could last shorter or longer. You know, we tend, as humans, to, to, to compartmentalize our lives into a week at a time. And especially when you're in school, that week is the repetitive unit, right? You have classes, students have classes at the same time on certain days, and we have competitions on certain days. But there's, no, there's nothing that says, there's no rule that says that a microcycle has to be a week long. It's just that we tend to think of our lives week by week, and we plan things in our lives week by week. But it doesn't have to be that way. What a coincidence it would be if biological adaptation was in a, with weak blocks of time, right? That we repeat the same workout every Tuesday or the same long run every Sunday in the calendar. What a coincidence it would be if that's the, the pattern by which our bodies adapt. So if you can, in the context of what you have to deal with in school, if you can, try to get away from thinking in the context of a week all the time. You don't have to do an interval workout every single Tuesday. It doesn't have to be that way. <coughs> so the microcycles should have their own specific objective, which are integrated with the objective in the entire mesocycle. So everything agrees. What you do this week matches what the theme of the whole cycle is, matches what the, the placement of that in the, the macrocycle. Everything has to make sense with, with each other. And the microcycles are where we include the individual workouts to match what the purpose of the training is. So what you decide to do with your athletes on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday is the very last thing that's decided. First you have to look at the whole macrocycle and how you're going to sequence the different phases of training. Then you divide that up into the different mesocycles, working backwards from the most important race. For the cycle, for the three or four week block of time before the most important race, what am I going to focus on? For the previous mesocycle to that, what am I going to focus on? The previous mesocycle to that, what am I going to focus on? 
And then when you have all that answered, then you break that down into the, the individual microcycles. And then you break that down into this is what we're going to do on Tuesday. And so there's many ways that you can set this up. So here's an example of, here's a nine week macro cycle. And just for the sake of argument to make it easier to explain, we'll just say that each micro cycle is one week. It doesn't have to be, but it's easier just to explain. So let's say that each one of these bars is a week, is a micro cycle. So we have the training load on the y axis, that could be volume, it could be intensity, it could be volume of intensity, whatever you define as the training load. So we have two weeks here, two micro cycles of the same training load, and then we back off our recovery week. And then we have we start the new mesocycle with two weeks of a higher training load relative to the first mesocycle. And then we back off for recovery week. And then we have another two weeks of a higher. So over time, we are increasing, slowly we are increasing the training stress, the training load. But then before we have an increase in the stress, we are allowing more time for recovery. So we are backing off on the training load and allowing our body to adapt and go through that curve that we showed prior, the adaptation, so that we super compensate to the stress, so that we can now handle a greater stress. Does that make sense, yes or yes? Yes. So that's one way to do it. Now we can do it different ways. So we could do it the way we just showed, two weeks at the same train load back off, two weeks at a higher back off, two weeks at a higher back off. Or we could do what I just call a staircase effect, where we can increase the train load from one week to the next before we back off a lot and recover. And then we can do the same pattern here. So this one is slightly higher than that one. This one is slightly higher train load than that one. So everything is relative to what came before it. Or you could combine the two. Let's do two weeks and try to habituate to the stress, we back off. Two weeks, habituate to a stress, back off. And then we can do the staircase in the third mesocycle. So which one you choose, this is a little bit of the art, and we hear a lot about the art and science of coaching. This is where the art comes in. You have to know your athletes and how quickly or slowly they adapt to training. That takes time. You know, when you get a freshman for the first time, you don't know. It takes time. So. You know, if they adapt quickly and they don't need as much recovery, then maybe you go here. <coughs> but if they need to have two weeks of the same stress before increasing the stress, then you choose that one. So that just takes time and getting to know your athletes and what's the best stimulus for that and how quickly you can increase the stress. What's one thing that runners, that happens to a lot of runners, that they increase the stress too quickly? It's the main cause of what? Injuries, Injuries right? With Hans Selye's thing, he was looking at, well, what happens to the road? They'll die, right? So, but no death. Your runners aren't going to die. But what will happen? Say it again. They'll get injured. And to a runner, that may as well be death. Right? Runners don't like to get injured because it prevents them from doing what? Running. Running. <laughs> and so oftentimes, you need to do this pattern instead of increasing the stress after just one week. And even if you have a four week, I think the next slide shows four week, yeah. So here's four week mesocycles where you use the same stress for three weeks in a row and then you back off. And then the same stress for another three weeks in a row and then you back off and so on. And then when you get to these, it's a little bit more stressful. Like here, you're increasing the stress for three weeks in a row before you back off a lot. And so a very talented runner, someone who adapts quickly, recovers quickly, they may be able to go to this. But newer runners, people who need more recovery, stick with this. And so habituation is a very important concept in training. Yes? Can you elaborate on the, on the backing off part of it? Like, do you still do? Oh, yeah, very good. Training? Do you yep. still do? Yeah. yeah. So, which do you think has the greater effect on fatigue? Volume or intensity? Usually, not all the time, usually. Volume. And so usually when I back off, 
back off on the volume of training. Now, if you're in the volume phase, and this is just mileage, and you're not doing any workouts, then you, only, then you only have that one variable to back off on. So maybe you do, you know, 40 miles a week, 40 miles, 40 miles, and then back down to 26. And then 45, 45, 45, back down to 30. So usually I cut the volume by a third. So they're doing two thirds the volume. In older people I coat, I back off by half. I'll do half as much volume. If you are doing workouts, then you can still keep the intensity, but you back off on the volume of intensity. So instead of doing 10 times 400 that you did in the previous weeks, so I'm just using a random example, you would do maybe five or six times 400 at the same speed. So that you're maintaining the fitness because you have the intensity in there, but you're backing off on the volume of intensity. So you're still recovering because you're not getting the complete stress, you're just getting a little bit of the stress. You're maintaining the intensity, but backing off on how much of that intensity you're doing. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? So that's key. Keep the intensity in there because intensity is key for fitness. So you don't want to just drop the intensity because then you're also going to lose fitness. So keep the intensity in there. Keep the workouts in there the same way. Don't do a new workout during that week. Don't do a brand new kind of workout. Do the same workout here as you did in the previous three weeks, but back off on how much of that workout you're doing. So back off on the number of reps. Keep the intensity, so keep the speed, the same pace. The purpose of the workout is the same, so the pace is the same. But just don't do as much of it. Instead of a five mile tempo run, do a three mile tempo run. So you're doing three fifths of the workout. So yes, good question. And then here's an example of five week mesocycle. So again, the same pattern, you can do four weeks of the same stress, back off, four weeks same, back off. Or you can do three weeks same, and then increase it for one week. Really go harder, and then back off a lot. Three weeks of the same, increase, back off. Or you can do two weeks of the same, two weeks of slightly higher, and back off. So, there's many ways you could do this. But which way you choose has to, there's gotta be a reason why you're choosing that way. Don't just do it arbitrarily because it looks good on paper and there's a little bit of artwork there and it's the art of coaching. And do it because it makes sense to do it that way. All right, now we get into the, the meat of stuff, is looking at the different ways to plan this out, the different kinds of periodization models. So the way periodization was first designed in the former Soviet Union, they did this with sprint-type athletes in track and field, jumpers, sprinters, and they called it linear periodization. That over time, we first, in the general preparation, we start working on endurance, even endurance specific to sprinting and jumping, and these two still have to work on endurance, not like going out and running easy, like distance runners, but everybody needs an endurance phase of training, regardless of the type of athlete. And then they move from that endurance phase, that extensive training, to the intensive training, where the speed, the power, is coming at the very end of the training plan. And so I just put the words up there. That, so the linear periodization follows its original design. Improves strength, speed, and power by progressive training from general conditioning, volume, to specific skills, intensity, with the highest intensity coming at the end of the training plan. And that makes perfect sense for athletes who are sprint power type athletes because the event that they're training for is intense. So it makes sense that the most intense training should come right before the competition. So this is the way it's done. General preparation phase, build volume. Specific preparation phase, continue to increase volume. And then for distance runners, this is the way we look. Focus on specific endurance. Heart legs, threshold runs, VO2 max workouts. That's the specific endurance. Whereas the general endurance, building volume, would be the mileage. Just getting the mileage in. The best runners are the ones who run the most. But then the specific endurance gets into the specific kinds of workouts that we talked about if you were here in the last session. That's what I wanted to do that session first and then this so that it makes more sense logically that way. And then the competition phase transition from aerobic, metabolic, and cardiovascular work, the stuff we just talked about in the last session, 
the threshold work, the VO2 max work, and then we transition to anaerobic metabolic and muscular work, the anaerobic capacity and anaerobic power. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? That's the traditional, most common way that distance runners train. We build up the volume first, then we go to the tempo runs, the VO2 max work, the anaerobic capacity, and they may touch a little bit on the, the pure speed, the anaerobic power. And then we go race. And then the recovery transition comes after that. And then we would start that cycle all over again with a new general preparation phase. But there are other ways to do it. And so we can reverse this order. And I call that, or they call it, reverse linear periodization. It's not used much, but there are specific circumstances in which I think that this is better. So we begin with higher intensity and then progress to lower intensity and higher volume. So one circumstance in which I think, and you guys will never, maybe some of you are marathoners, half marathoners yourself, usually in a group of distance running coaches, there's usually runners who do their own thing. You don't usually see that with the sprint group or the jump group, the thrower group, they're not actively competing anymore. But distance runners are special. You know, we could do this our whole lives. And so usually when I talk to a group of distance running coaches, like who's running a marathon in here? Yeah, half the room, see? So it's, that's what makes runners special, that we, we can do this our whole lives and we compete our whole lives. So one circumstance in which I think reverse linear periodization is better is when you're training for longer races where the heavy endurance work comes at the end of the training plan before the race, which is endurance dependent, the half marathon, the marathon, instead of doing it the other way around where you're doing speed work right before the marathon. And so you can train speed first and then work on enduring a high fraction of that speed. <coughs> I also think it's important for younger athletes who have no history, or even older athletes, who have no history of speed work behind them. I mean, we see a lot of adults who want to run a faster marathon, but they never ran in high school, never ran in college, they never did any anaerobic training, but yet they still want to hammer that endurance nail into the wall and try to improve their marathon. The example I gave in the last session about the world record holders in the marathon, you know how fast they can run one mile? Very, very fast. At the Olympic level, they can run one mile. You know, Ilya Kipchoge, everyone's heard that name, even though Kelvin Kipton now owns the world record because he broke it in Chicago. But everyone's heard the name Ilya Kipchoge. He's run a 201 marathon, and he ran 159 in that time trial that Nike set up. You guys familiar with all that? He's run a 350 mile. He was a world champion on the track at 5K before he ever ran a marathon. These guys, these women, are quite fast. In order to run a marathon that fast, you have to be able to run one mile very fast, because you can't run a marathon only 20 seconds per mile, slower than your mile time, right? That's not gonna happen. So if you wanna be fast even for the longer distances, you gotta be fast for the shorter distances. And so for people, whether they're older and they're coming into running later in life, or you inherit a freshman or a sophomore and they've never run before, it's very good to work on their skill of running first and their speed first, and then you work on their endurance of speed. Oh, what do you know? That's a title of one of my books, The Endurance of Speed. And that point is missed a lot because we're always running at some fraction of our maximum speed. You take a group of 10K runners and you race them over 200 meters, whoever wins the race at 200 meters is also going to be the fastest at 10K. But if they're a group of 10K runners, it's not obviously Usain Bolt is not going to beat a marathon. Right? So if you take a group of distance runners, of homogeneous distance runners, and you race them over a short distance, you can tell who's going to win the longer distance by how fast they run the shorter distance. If they're a trained distance runner, you know, you look at these really good, watch the Olympics this summer in Paris on TV, unless you go, anybody going to Paris? I wish I could go to Paris. I've never been to Paris. And then guess what? In four and a half years, where are the Olympics going to be? Los Angeles, the city of angels. My permanent home is in San Diego. I've been living there for a long time. But for this school year, I'm pretending to be a college professor in Georgia. So I moved to Georgia for these nine months, this school year, so I could pretend to be a college professor. I skipped class yesterday. I told my students, we're not in class because I have to get on an airplane. 
they were all happy about that. <laughs> I try to make class so entertaining that they want to come. Did you know that that's also the job of a teacher, to be an entertainer? If you want people to learn, you've got to entertain them. That's why I work so hard on these jokes for you guys. <laughs> because if I entertain you, I have your attention in the palm of my hand. And if I have your attention, then guess what? Greater chance of learning. So for long races, for people who are inexperienced, who have never done the speed where the real speed worked before, it's a good idea to start with that and then work on the endurance of speed, yes? So when you do a VO2 max interval workout, you're not just training VO2 max, you're also training anaerobic metabolism. You're also training speed. Because when you rev the aerobic engine as fast as it can go, there's also an anaerobic component to that. And then something else I just mentioned, that the early introduction of high intensity can also improve the running scale. Now, when you run fast, when, you, when people run slow, you ever look outside and society, when you go run along the river path, this morning when I went, it was early enough that there was nobody else out there. But every time I go run someplace where there's a lot of runners out there, you watch these runners when they're running slow, what does it often look like? I mean, there people look very bad when they run, a lot of them. But if you focus on the intensity first, what happens when people try to sprint? Don't they usually look, even if they're inexperienced, don't they usually look better when they run faster? <laughs> Running faster tends to do a lot to clean up the, the crap. You know? It cleans up the, the, the bad things that people do. Because when you run fast, you have to get that foot off the ground quickly. and It has a way of cleaning up bad form. And so you practice the good form with technique. You do drills. 
And then you go and you do sprinting, and you can clean up the form and work on the skill. Before then, you go take that better skill to go in running 30, 40, 50, 60 miles a week. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? Will you comment if you're going to go reverse linear like this? Because you know, we're thinking about these youngsters in track, like the volume of that field to max intensity that early. Like, what are you talking about? Well, it doesn't have to be a lot. So, yeah, so will you hear the last talk? You know, I'm, I don't want to admit that publicly, but. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Well, but you, I, just, I'm you just admitted it publicly. Right. Because <laughs> that, that always makes me nervous, right? Because you can get, you can just like tax the kids so high in that training zone. Obviously. Yeah. And so it depends on how much of it you do, right? It's always the volume of intensity. You know, VO2 max interval, you don't have to do reps until exhaustion, right? Like we talked about before. You can control it as the coach. You can say, we're just going to do three reps. We're going to do three 800s today. That's it. At VO2 max intensity. So it's a very low volume workout. But you do you have the intensity in there. So yeah, you can control. I mean, you're the coach, right? You can control whatever you want to control. You can control the volume of intensity they do. I wouldn't do two VO2 max workouts each week right away, right? When they have no training behind them. So nothing says the volume has to come first. Nothing says the easy mileage has to come first. Look at sprinters. Sprinters never do aerobic training first. They go right to the intensity. Right? But everybody with distance runners says, oh no, you have to do the mileage first before you do the interval training. But other athletes don't do that. Do soccer players do that? Do tennis players do that? Do sprinters in track do that? Does a football wide receiver do that? Nothing says that intensity can't come first. You just control the volume of intensity. And you don't do 10 reps to, at the gate the first day. Does that make sense? Nothing says the speed can't come first. You just control it so that the athlete doesn't get it. So good question, glad you brought that up. Good point. And then we have another model called block periodization, where we block a lot of stretch early in a mesocycle. So I'll show you what that is. It's a sequence of specialized mesocycles called blocks that concentrate on only a single or a couple of compatible abilities at a time using a large volume of workouts. So you basically hammer the athletes early for one microcycle, the first microcycle of a mesocycle, and then you back off on that. You still keep the intensity in there, but you don't do as many workouts. So maybe the first week, when they're coming off of recovery week and they have over or super compensated, they're ready to handle a greater stress, and then you hammer them with multiple workouts that first week. And then you back off and say, all right, the next two weeks, now we're just going to do one workout. The same type of workout, we're just going to do one a week instead of three or four that week. So it's a way to really induce fitness adaptation quickly because you are hammering the subjects, the athletes, the scientists call them subjects, but it's so clinical, right? You take them and we call them subjects. You're hammering them early, but you don't only you only do it for a short period of time. Because if you were to hammer them and give them four workouts a week, if you would repeat that week after week, what's gonna happen? You're gonna get exhausted, you're gonna start spiraling downward because you're on the downward slope of that fatigue curve. And you're always gonna be operating there. You don't want to always operate there. You want that fatigue curve to rebound, you want to adapt, you want to overcompensate, you want to improve your fitness. So block periodization can be very effective for a mature athlete who can handle a lot of work in a very short period of time. And then you back off on how much of that work you give. Does that make sense? <coughs> so that's block periodization. Then we have one more, undulate periodization, where we continually change, we undulate, we continually change the stimulus even within a microcycle. Drastic variations in volume and intensity either daily or weekly throughout the training program. So we can do that to maintain or increase aerobic development during the latter macro mesocycles of a macrocycle. Because you never want to neglect. One flaw of linear periodization is that you, know, you build the volume up, all the aerobic work, and then you start transitioning. You drop the volume and increase the intensity, but then by the end of the program, it's all this intensity but where's the aerobic 
it, it's all the way back there. And so one way around that, you can do what I said before, that if you have two training purposes, you use a maintenance load to maintain, like maybe you do a long run every Sunday just to maintain the aerobic fitness while you're trying to train anaerobic fitness. Or you could do the undulating. This kind of training is actually very popular among strength train athletes, bodybuilders, where maybe on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they'll do maybe a, a <clears throat> they'll get so excited, like I'm coughing on myself. <laughs> they'll do maybe a very high intense workout on a Monday, like maybe 95% of one RM, if you guys are familiar with those terms. And then maybe they'll do an eight to 10 RM on uh, Wednesday, and then maybe a tw 12 to 15 RM on a Friday. So they undulate the intensity and the volume. So it's very common, very popular method in bodybuilders and other strength type athletes. Not as common in endurance athletes. But it is another way to do it. Okay? So, if we were to plot out the entire 52 week year of an athlete, this is one way it could look using a linear periodization model. So for high school or college, we have cross country season, so we have the general prep, and this is the number of weeks, the general prep, specific prep, transition, recovery, transition. And then if you have an indoor track season, then you have the same thing, you repeat, the general prep, the specific prep, the competition, recovery. If you don't, then that gets enveloped in the outdoor track, and that would make the general prep and specific prep longer. The general prep would be much longer, specific prep would be a little longer. Because the recovery transition doesn't need to change that, you don't need to change that duration. And the competition, it could be maybe lengthened depending on exactly what it is you're trying to focus on, which races are the most important. But the two phases that would really change would be the general prep and the specific, you just lengthen those two phases if you don't have a specific indoor track season. Then this, you know, this and this, the indoor and outdoor track can go together as one bigger phase. And then you would repeat it again, general prep, specific prep, competition recovery, and then the general prep in the summer. So there's 52 weeks, that's what it would look like, a linear periodization model, if you're looking to peak three times a year. You, know, you have three distinct competitive seasons that you're trying to target. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? Yeah. And then if that's not specific enough for you, I actually took the pictures from my book and I put it on the slides. So now this is what it would look like. Phase one. Cross country season, <coughs> two weeks with a training intensity distribution. So this would be low threshold, at threshold, the VO2 max higher than threshold, and then even higher than VO2 max. And you can see how that training intensity distribution changes throughout the phases and throughout the year. So let's just say that these are weeks. So you have microcycle one, week one, week two, week three, and then the fourth week recovery microcycle. And then you figure out what percentage of the peak mileage. So all this has to be decided beforehand. What's the peak mileage that I'm going to have the athletes hit that season? And then you have percentages. So we start here, 90% of the peak mileage, 90%. We hit 100%, and then we back off at 65%. And then four to five easy runs, one to two acidosis threshold workouts. Twice a week we do strides after the easy run. And then we repeat that, and we back off that we only have one workout. Keep the intensity, but we only do one word. We back off on the volume of intensity for that recovery week. And then you can see we transition from the threshold work to hill work and VO2 max work. And then we transition to the anaerobic capacity. So AC here is anaerobic capacity. And then we have the recovery. Okay, so that would be the linear periodization model for cross country. And then from that, then we go to indoor track. And then the same kind of thing. We have the general preparation, the specific competition and recovery. And so this goes week by week to show you what to do, how many of each workout. So we go from two threshold workouts to uh, two VO2 max workouts, and then an the anaerobic capacity workout each week. So we're transitioning from the easy running to the quality threshold and then VO2 max and anaerobic capacity. And we would even go one step further if you're training you know, an 800 meter runner, you also dip into the anaerobic power and the real fast interval training. Mm -hmm. So that would be indoor track, and then we repeat the same thing for 
outdoor track, you just keep building on what came before. So the general preparation is more of what you were doing before. It's not re you're repeating the pattern, but you're not repeating the exact same stimulus. Over time, you're increasing the volume. You're increasing the volume of workouts from phase to phase. And then at the end of all this, race, 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 race. All right, you train, 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 and you race, 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 race. And then the summer. So again, we back off a little bit. We started 70% of what the peak mileage is doing in the summer, 70%, 70%, 70%. <coughs> Start the new school year. Does all that make sense? Yeah. And then if you do pick up the book, not to keep plugging the book, but if you do pick up a copy of the book, I have a menu in the back that you can choose. Just like you go to a restaurant, you choose the different categories. Oh, the, you have the fish, you have the poultry, you have the spaghetti, and then you can choose from, it's the same thing. I have a workout menu of all the VO2 max workouts, all the threshold workouts, all the anaerobic capacity, and then you pick which workouts you put in there. But with that, as I get older, I start quoting myself. <laughs> and so this comes right out of the book. You can't understand the value of a whole process by separating the parts from the process or the process from the parts. When you separate the parts from the process, there is no process. There are only parts. That's what periodized training is all about. It's a way to put the parts together to perfect the system, to find out what works because you've worked it. When you build a house, isn't the furniture you put in each room the very last thing you decide? First, you've got to build the whole house. You have to have the structure of the whole house. You have to architect the house. The house is the macrocycle. The rooms of each house have to then be planned. The rooms are the mesocycles. Then within each room, you have the microcycles. What is each room going to look like? And then each room has furniture in it. The furniture are the workouts. The workouts are the very last thing that's decided. First you have to architect the whole house, then the rooms, and then you finally get to the theme of each room, and that dictates what furniture you put in there, the color of the furniture. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes or yes? And I do want to make a plug for my TED Talk. If you haven't seen my TED Talk yet, I hope that you will watch it, How Running Like an Animal Makes Us Human. I did that in uh, March of 2022, so it's almost two years ago I did that. That was a great honor. So if you have 14 minutes to spare before you go to bed tonight in your hotel room, if you have 14 minutes to spare, then check out the TED Talk that I gave in Rexburg, Idaho, How Running Like an Animal Makes Us Human. Please stay connected. I'd love to hear about how your athletes are doing, and I want to know. You know, we're, we're so involved right now, and then I leave you guys, and then I have no idea what's going on. I want to know how your athletes are doing. So stay connected. Social media is a good for that, at least. It allows us to stay connected to each other. Okay, so make sure you will follow each other, and then you know, keep posting about you know, keep promoting. The athletes love it when they get promoted, right? So promote your athletes, and, and that way I can also find out how they're doing. Okay, so with that, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So just a reminder then, uh, if you want to get your name in the drawing, you can do that now. The drawing will be held after the, the first afternoon session, so after the third session. And here we have Megan Koski from University of River Falls. All right? Oh yeah, I got to stop this. Thanks, you stop it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being here.